well, we take what we've learned in derivatives, apply it to physics, and see the connection. So some of these things, some of you have already done in physics. We are going to do some things very simplistically in calculus to look at kinematics, which is a study of velocity and acceleration. We know that the derivative is the slope of a curve. And so derivatives deal with rates of change. So common rates of change involve velocity displacement and time. The rate of displacement with respect to time? Well, if displacement is distance and time is in hours and stuff like that, if I say something like kilometers per hour, that all already resonates with you. You're like, oh, that's a speed, that's a velocity. So if we take the derivative of a displacement graph, we will get a velocity graph. So velocity is always the derivative of displacement. And if you want to find the instantaneous velocity, you can always do that by taking the first derivative. So a lot of these questions are fairly straightforward. Here we've got a displacement question, and they give us the equation for it, t squared plus 3t. If you wanted to find the velocity, all you need to do is take the derivative. So I take the derivative of that equation. Velocity is equal to the derivative, which would be 2t plus 3. Straightforward. Now I have an equation for velocity. And one of the questions that gets often asked is something about initial. What's the initial displacement? What's the initial velocity? What do we know about time when they're asking something initially? What do you think the time would be? Zero. So if you're asking for something's initial velocity, you're asking when its time was zero. And it's just a matter of plugging in zero into our velocity form. If you wanted to find it after four seconds, well, then you would just plug in four into your velocity formula. Relatively straightforward. So the idea being is if you have any kind of equation measuring distance, as soon as you take its derivative, you get an equation for velocity. So one of the things that's really cool is here's a question from grade 11. And in grade 11 quadratics, you would often have something thrown into the air, and it would have a parabola. And they give you the equation of the problem. Now, some interesting things to notice about grade 11 questions. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll do this question first, and then I'll talk about interesting things about these questions. So, what is its velocity after two seconds? If we take the derivative, we get a velocity formula. And what's interesting about the velocity formula here is it becomes negative 9.8t. What does that negative 9.8 remind you of? Gravity. So what was interesting in grade 11 questions is that they tended not to use 4.9. They tended to use either 5 because 5 is a nicer number than 4.9. 
So in grade 11, they were like, well, we want to give you night numbers. We'll use 10 for gravity, minus 10 for gravity instead of minus 9 for gravity. Or sometimes you'd see a minus 16 here because does anybody know gravity in feet per second? You don't? I think something like 32 feet per second. So then they would put a 16 there so that it would be the questions they were giving you, they were trying to be realistic. So first of all, very interesting. Any kind of question that has gravity, its displacement equation will always have a negative 4.9 t squared in it, which is kind of cool that that gravity shows up in it. When will it hit this? When will the stone hit the ground? So one of the things that you have to be able to do here is decipher what equation do they want me to use? Should I figure use a velocity equation when it hits the ground? Should I use a distance equation when it hits the ground? In this case, if it hits the ground, its height would be zero. So I would plug into my original equation what its value would be. And when you solve this, you get t equals plus or minus five seconds. So now this is where in a real life problem, you have to think about this a little bit. If I drop a stone, will it hit the ground in five seconds? Or will it have hit the ground five seconds before I dropped it? Because that's what the negative five means. Negative five means five seconds before I dropped it, it hits the ground. In fact, it comes from the ground, catches my hand, and I let it go again. Not very realistic. So the only answer that makes sense is the positive five seconds. And then we can take this and we can say, I can find how fast that stone is when it's going to the ground. So we can make a decision here of whether this is a good game to play with your friend. I will go up to the top of this cliff. By the way, you can see that this cliff, when time is zero, the height is 122.5 meters above the ground. I can go to the top of this cliff, and my friend can be at the bottom of the cliff. And I can drop a stone, and he can try to catch it. Is this a good idea? Okay, this is what we can decide. Well, right now, with calculus, we can find out how fast is that stone going when it reaches the ground. So we can plug in 5 into our velocity formula. Negative 49 meters per second. That would be like running a 100 meter dash in about two seconds. I'm trying to imagine if I would like to stand in the 100 meter dash and get hit by Usain Bolt if he was running. And he's only going about 10 meters a second. So this stone is going at nearly 15 meters a second. Maybe it's not a good idea to drop stones and see if my friend can catch them at the bottom of this cliff. So what is fascinating about these height questions is sometimes they're always parabolas because gravity causes something to go down to the ground. Okay? Sometimes in these height questions you get someone throwing a ball up into the air. With that same thing they would give you, okay, I'm starting, and you have your negative 4.9 t squared plus 17 plus 3. So this would mean I'm starting at 3 meters above the ground. I've still got my gravity built in at the negative 9.8. But interestingly is if I found the derivative of this, this second number will always be an initial velocity. So now I've got my velocity formula, my derivative and my displacement. If I put t as 0, that will be my initial velocity. 
And so it's just interesting how these equations tell us a lot of things that we really can see if we know how to calculate. So if the rate of change of distance with respect to time is velocity, the rate of change of velocity with respect to time is acceleration. So acceleration is the derivative of velocity. So I like to remember this with the word to go from distance to velocity to acceleration. So whenever you take the derivative this way, that's when you're going to go to Derivative of displacement will be velocity. Derivative of velocity will be acceleration. And you know that acceleration due to gravity is constant, right? It's always negative 9.8. If we look at our previous question, right, what's our velocity? Negative 9.8 t. Can you see that if you did another derivative on that, you would just get negative 9.8. And then that would be acceleration. And there would be no change to that acceleration. It would always be constant. So then acceleration would be the second derivative of displacement. Again, ah. right? If you went from s down to acceleration, you'd have to do the derivative So try this question on your own. I'll give you the answers in a second. All right, let's see how you did. So in example four, we've got our displacement formula. And this time it's saying, when is it at rest? So this is the part that we have to understand. When something is at rest, we would basically say it's not moving. But what does that, how do we say something is not moving? we would say that its velocity is zero. Interestingly, if you throw something up in the air, the moment it gets to its maximum, it momentarily stops and changes direction and comes back down. So we would say that that golf ball was at rest at the very bottom. For instantaneous milliseconds, it was at rest at the very top. And that's when its velocity would be zero. So to calculate this, we would need to find the derivative, because the derivative gives us our velocity, set the derivative or the velocity equal to zero, and then we could solve.
And then if you want to find the values of s at these times, now you'd be plugging those values back into your original equation. So plug in 3 into the original equation, plug in 1 into the original equation. The rest is just type it into your calculator or doing some mental math. And then finally, if you want to find acceleration, so acceleration, we'd have to do the derivative again, get our acceleration formulas, and then plug in both 3 and 1 into our acceleration formulas.